On December the 7th, 1976, Universal Television was shooting on the Pike in Long Beach, California. In this episode of The Six Million Dollar Man, the Laugh in the Dark ghost ride was the front for a secret missile launcher. Well, after dark. What are you going to do? I'll check around, have my fortune told. Okay, then I'll check out Madame Shearer's trailer. I don't think you should, it's too dangerous. But the Laugh in the Dark concealed quite a different sort of secret. I was working with the set dressing crew, actually inside this ride. All kinds of weird stuff hanging in here. One thing was a day glow red human form uh, hanging by a noose on the wall. And I looked at this thing and uh, it looked awful real to me. So I went over to move the arm to see if he had any genitals there, which wouldn't have been on paper mache. And they indeed were there. Shriveled a bit, but there. <laughs> but the arm snapped off. Looked like beef jerky wrapped around a bone. <laughs> Pretty well dried out. You know, he was very light. The coroner's investigation that followed this discovery unearthed the extraordinary story of a third-rate outlaw called Elmer McCurdy and his travels across America, a journey that started with his death in 1911 in the Osage Hills of Oklahoma. Why do you whisper green grass? Why tell the trees what ain't so? Whispering grass, the trees don't have to know. No, no. Why tell them all your secrets? Who kissed It was just one of those days that happened in the Osage. And those days were tough. Grass, the trees don't need to know. In 1905, oil was struck and the money became abundant for the Osage Indians. This was a fiasco for robbery, killing, uh, anything would go as far as uh, trading, outwitting the Indian for his, his uh, allotments, his money. I'll tell you one thing was Indian country. We turned out more outlaws than any place else. Blue Ribbon, the best. I like it here, though. I put up with the snakes. If they bite me, I'll bite them back. That's why I'm still alive. Immune. Into this wild country came Elmer McCurdy, a 31-year-old drifter from Bangor, Maine. He'd been a plumber, a miner, a soldier, a drinker. Now he was after an easier way of making money. He was a safe cracker, wasn't he? Pretty well. Well, of course, he held up that talk train. about McCurdy? Yeah, he's asked about McCurdy being Well, different. McCurdy was two or three things. Uh, he was, his uh, career as an outlaw was rather ill-fated, and he was kind of bumbled at most of the things he did as an outlaw. I don't you tell it to the breeze. Chautauqua, Kansas, was a small but prosperous spa town. And everyone Elmer McCurdy and two associates decided to rob the bank. Yes, you did. You told them once before. They blew the door of the vault across the room, so wrecking the furniture, it ain't no and woke up the whole town. Mm. Mm -hmm. They had to leave most of the loot behind. Why tell them all the old things? When Elmer held up the Iron Mountain train, he used so much nitroglycerin that 4,000 silver dollars melted and were blown into the corner of the safe. Afterwards, the railroad needed a crowbar to get them out. By late September, Elmer decided to give law-breaking a rest. He took a job on Charlie Rivard's ranch in the Osage Indian Territory, just south of the Kansas line. Uncle Charlie was very much loved in the family and um, he had a glass eye, and every once in a while, to shock us, he'd take his glass eye out. <laughs> but he was a tall old man and very, very thin. Oh, he's just an old Indian, if you ever saw an Indian. He didn't wear no blanket or nothing. He just dressed like we are. But uh, he was 
Good old Indian. I've eaten with him many times. He always hired extra hands to help with the alfalfa harvest. And um, Elmer showed up. He What's gave his name as Frank. In our family, we always called him Frank. Uncle Charlie was a great talker in the sense he liked to talk about politics and um, Shakespeare and Greek mythology and so forth. They used to sip whiskey after the hard day's work and uh, visit. In October, Elmer asked for a few days off. He had a new plan. He had targeted the uh, MK&T Railroad because he had heard of the Osage Indian royalty payments, and uh, which amounted to three to four hundred thousand dollars, they said, and they knew it was coming, and uh, so they lay in wait for it. But he got the wrong train, and that was uh, the uh, disappointment in his in his robbery. However, the second train coming had four hundred thousand dollars on it, and he missed it. It was one of the smallest train robberies in history. So all he got was was the conductor's watch, a few dollars, and an undetermined amount of whiskey, which were came in jugs like we have here. They carried whiskey. Whiskey peddlers came in here all the time. After the robbery, the bungling bandits made their escape. They split up, and Elmer headed north. Into each life, some rain must fall. He picked up the whiskey, and he made his trip then through the woods, through the Black Dog Trail, back to Charlie Rivard's ranch at the Caney River, between there and the Kansas line. He got there, I think, toward evening. And uh, Uncle Charlie, the next morning, <clears throat> sent him out to collect eggs so they could um, scramble eggs for the dozens of cats that were always on Uncle Charlie's farm. And uh, on his way to the barn, Elmer evidently saw the posse come up to the front of the house. Stringer Fenton and the posse had come to the ranch as the result of a tip-off from one of Elmer's associates. Uncle Charlie said to the sheriff, what, what's the problem? And they told him that they were looking for a man named Elmer McCurdy. And Charlie said, well, I have a Frank McCurdy working for me. The sheriff said, we'd like to talk to him. So Uncle Charlie said, well, I'll go out to the barn and get him. So he started out there, and um, Elmer called him from the corn crib. And he said, uh, Charlie, they're here for me. I would like one at last favor from you. Would you go get me a bottle of whiskey and climb in here in the corn crib and have a drink with me? And so Uncle Charlie did. They stayed there until they drank the whole bottle. And I guess they were feeling pretty good by then. But uh, anyway, then um, he said, okay, Charlie, go out, go on back and um, tell the sheriff that I'm I'm coming out shooting because um, I don't intend to be taken alive. I tell them all the old things They're buried under the snow Well, I was about six years old, I imagine. We lived right back over west here on the river and uh, heard all that shooting and that. Uh, Dad didn't know what was going on, and so we, he took me with him. I'd never seen anything like that before, and he carried him out and had him laid out there on an old table of some kind, and he was dead. First dead man I ever saw. I don't know how many times he'd been shot, but uh, you see one hole in him right up in here. It sounded like Cox's army down there for a while. Everybody was shooting. There wasn't nobody went around there for a while after that either. You know? 
They didn't want to see no more of that. They took the body of Elmer McCurdy to Poor Husker, the largest town in Osage County. There he was embalmed with arsenic and set up in the funeral home, waiting for someone to claim him. Nobody came. For five years he stood in a corner of the showroom, where the free-flowing air helped his body dry out. Gradually, the Oklahoma outlaw became a mummy. It was a curiosity. Uh, did you ever see those postcards, Bill? There were some out that taken up there in Paul Huska of him. Some some people, I don't know who put the postcards out, but I, I saw at least one postcard. When we was kids there, well, we'd go down there and peek in at him and <laughs> see a dead man. Everybody in the town of Pahuska knew that the mummy was down there. My mother's cousins, Gladys and Della Rebard, they would roller skate down to the mortuary. And they knew the son of the mortician very well. I guess he was around their age. Anyway, he um, would put roller skates on the poor old guy, and they'd all take him out for an excursion. Both of my cousins, Stella and Gladys, both told me the story, and they remembered it very well. One day in October 1916, two gentlemen from the Great Patterson Carnival Show arrived at Poor Husker Station to claim the body. They said they were relatives, but clearly weren't. They did, however, persuade the authorities to release the mummy. And so it was that five years after his death, the Oklahoma outlaw embarked on a second career. He became a traveling man. His new owners exhibited him as a sideshow attraction in the county fairs and carnivals of small-town America. The old-time American carnivals basically consisted of a bunch of shows. There would be uh, what we called a posing show, where the young lady would pose in various stages of dress and undress as much as the law would allow. So it would be a wild animal show, where a guy would go into a cage with uh, lions and tigers, crack the whip, Arr! There would be a ten in one, ten attractions in one. That would be a freak show. You had giants, you had midgets, you had a mule-faced woman, uh, two-headed babies. Some of them were real, some of them weren't. I can remember uh, oh, on the Olsen Carnival one day, my wife was with me. Suddenly, uh, this little creature about this high, Carol said, look at that, that looks like a giant crab. And what it was, it was Ronnie and Donnie, who were Siamese twins, joined at the abdomen, walking around the lot. And interspaced with this, of course, would be the games, uh, the cotton candy, the popcorn, the wheels, uh, the roll-down, the razzle-dazzle, etc. That's what the old-time carnivals were like. I mean, this was show business. <laughs> Lydia, oh Lydia, say, have you met Lydia, oh Lydia, the tattooed lady? She has eyes that folks adore so, and a torso even more so. Lydia, oh Lydia, that encyclopedia, oh Lydia, the queen of tattoo. Far too bitchy will do a mazurka in jazz with a view of Niagara that no artist has. And on a clear day you can see Alcatraz, you can learn a lot. From Lydia. 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 Then, of course, the great gimmick was the embalmed body of an old Western outlaw. Elmer McCurdy being one of the uh, great examples of this. Years ago, every sideshow in the United States had a mummy. If you didn't have a mummy, you didn't have a sideshow. You had what we call a rag bag. In the United States, a rag bag is the sorest type of sideshow there is. So if you didn't have a mummy, you were a rag bag. And I never had a rag bag. I had a first-class, top-notch museum sideshow. Maria Day is a, a nightclub entertainer. She was killed by her boyfriend, and her body was tossed into Great Salt Lake. Because of all this political correctness, that's rampant in the United States, at least, uh, I voluntarily took her off the road over 20 years ago, and she's been in retirement ever since. I've had all kind of mummies. Uh, I went all the way to California and bought gold to Jimmy. And what a nightmare. Crossing the entire country. A 6,000 mile round trip. And bringing our mummy back in a station wagon. I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> we 
we had just crossed the bridge over from uh, San Francisco, went over to Oakland, actually where we picked up Gold Tooth Jimmy, and we had just got about two blocks. And here comes about four police cars with the sirens wide open and the blue lights flashing. And I said, oh, hell, we've had it now. Pull over. We just got started on a 3,000-mile trip. We pulled over. The police cars went right by us. They weren't after us. Scared the hell out of all of us. <laughs> but anyway, we went through all these states, and we had the police stop us half a dozen different times. We wanted to see it, and they wanted to take a look at this and what's that. And my brother, who's a retired Army officer, he said never again. He would never take another trip with me. He, he said, that's, that's it. He's not riding with no damn mummies anymore. But anyway, we came back, and we stayed at uh, uh, we stayed at his house, and we took go to took him into the two-car garage because we had to do a lot of riding around, and we don't want to be going all over Colorado Springs with a stiff in the back of the station wagon. So we propped him up against the wall. And his wife like had a fit. <laughs> Unfortunately, Hurricane France put a number on me. That just about finished my winter quarters here. I've never get over that. Now. I had a gigantic tree. Mucho grande arbor in Espanol. It came crashing right through my living room. And one tree landed right across uh, the boar constrictor's cage, Charlie. I mean, totally smashed it. And it came within that close to killing him. And I've had that snake for 14 years. I'm sad over the fact that side shows are dying out. The whole country is losing something. This interest in dead bodies or mummies, I think everyone has got something on their mind. They don't want to admit it, but death. They say, you know, tax and death is certain. Well, tax is not because you, you don't have to pay it. You can go to jail. But death is certain. You've got to die. So in, a, in a sense, they're looking at their own selves. The mummified body of the Oklahoma outlaw passed from owner to owner on the carnival circuit. By the late 1920s, he was to be found touring Washington State with the Crafts Carnival. There, the next door pitch was operated by an ex-policeman called Lewis Sonny. When I was about 15 years old, my dad, um, or maybe a little younger, I'm, I'm 83 years old now, uh, my dad started a wax figure museum. He started to make wax figures on all the outlaws. God, I used to know every damn one of them. I used to dress them. Uh, Jesse James, Billy the Kid, uh, Gordon Northcott, Hickman the Fox. There was just criminal. 150 of them. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, a guy named Red Goodhue, an old Irishman or something. And he used to uh, lecture, you know, this dummy is this. He was a very good speaker, but he was a drunk. And he had a deal with my brother that every night when they closed the show, that my brother would handcuff him to the bed. <laughs> my brother would handcuff him to the bed uh, for he couldn't go out and get drunk. And that went on for years. And uh, and now now these uh, all these years they're both dead. <laughs> One day, Lewis got lucky. Another carney approaches him and wants to borrow $500. And Lewis said, well, what do you got as collateral? He says, I got a body. And, oh, okay. And that was the body of Elmer McCurdy. So Lewis gives the guy the 500. Naturally, the guy screws and he never sees him again. And But Lewis has got the body. So he puts the body into his wax show. And the body stayed in Sunny Amusement Company for years and years and years. One day in the 1930s, Elmer's old friend Charlie Rivard was visiting Los Angeles. As he walked down Main Street, his eye was caught by a poster with a familiar face on it. The sign said, come in and see the Oklahoma outlaw shot on Charlie Rivard's farm. He just couldn't believe that they were exhibiting his body, you know, because it was someone that he knew and was rather fond of. While he was standing there, these two old men walked up and one of them was saying, oh yes, I was there the day that they shot Elmer McCurdy. Uncle Charlie kind of walked back so he could get a good look at these guys. And um, he didn't know either one of them. And he was thoroughly disgusted with the whole thing. So he walked on. But Lewis Sonny's main line of business wasn't the waxworks. It was exhibiting his own true crime movies. See, my dad, in his mind, he was always a policeman. He had a lot of different motion pictures. 
everything was policeman stuff. And he would even stand out in front of the theater with a handcuff and handcuff people. Hey, Rod, do you know how to shake hands now? What do you mean, shake hands? It's like a pig. It's not now good. A march of crime consisted of newsreel stories about the sort of criminals that were in the wax museum. Sometimes the facts were embellished a little. Elma McCurdy, Oklahoma train robber. Single-handed, he held up the Katy Flyer, killing two men. He was shot and made helpless. He feared lynching, so he drank a bottle of acid and died instantly. McCurdy was also an addict and peddler of drugs. He started more young people using marijuana than any other man. Today, the body is a puzzle to science because of its fine condition. Probably some chemical action between the acid he drank and his dope-saturated tissues caused this mummy-like preservation. So after death, Elma finally earned money instead of stealing it. He was showing a theater and, uh, and not doing very good. Follow me? Now, Dwayne Esper was showing a theater two blocks down on the same street, and they had a lineup second to none. I think the name of the picture was Seventh Commandments. You could not uh, monkey with another guy's wife, you know. And uh, um, and so he goes over there and finds out what about all this thing. Well, he didn't know the guy was selling sex. My dad never knew nothing about sex, you know. He thought you don't sex with you when you have children, you know. And uh, and so he bought in half with Dwayne Esper, and uh, they become uh, half-assed partners. And that's how you become in the exploitation business. What was the purpose of the exploitation movie? The exploitation movie was a cheaply made movie that could be made in a matter of days that uh, normally uh, dealt with some subject that the major pictures couldn't touch as long as the subject was in extremely bad taste. And it was sold like a traveling carnival on a local level to get into town quick as long as the topic was hot, get out of town before the cops came, and uh, take home your ill-gotten gains. Gee, it's hot. I think I'll shed this while we sit and chat. It was the old carnival yeah. tease. The yeah, old... Okay. This was the beginning of the nudie business, the nudie cutie business. And the guys would keep coming back week after week after week. Well, what brings you out on such a warm day? These pictures were as rigid in their construction as a medieval morality play. In all of them, virtue was triumphant in the end. I mean, that was the square up. Dwayne Esper, Lewis Sonny's new partner, was another old carny who used to ride in a motodrome under the name of the Fearless Chick. Ah, Dwayne, now there, there was the character of all characters in the exploitation business. Laughter. Dwayne had a picture that today is very famous called Reefer Madness. Him and my dad made a picture. My dad financed it. The whole picture cost five thousand dollars. Named Maniac. And it didn't do no business, so they changed the name to Sex Maniac. And then I did a little business. Not unlike an oyster or a crepe. <laughs> but the gleam is gone. <laughs> My grandfather, Dwayne, Dwayne Esper, it wasn't enough for him to uh, better you in a deal or to do business and, and you come out equals in a deal. He, uh, uh, if he had a character flaw, the flaw was is that he had to really screw you in the deal. I mean, he was just notorious for that type of thing, which is what happened to me, you know, where he, he didn't pay me either, So and, I, and I'm his grandson. At one point... Dwayne wanted to take Elmer on the road as an example of the evils of dope. And he leased Elmer from Lewis. And he was traveling the country with narcotic, with Elmer in the lobby, with a big placard that this was a doper uh, who was so crazed by dope that he had to be shot by this posse.
Uh, my grandmother, Hildegard von Stady, wrote them. The narcotic script is a loose lift off of how she grew up. Her uncles who raised her, her mother was only 13 when she was born, but her uncles who raised her, um, the one who was on opium was actually a doctor, a medically educated doctor, who made more money selling the snake oil. And she would go out and dance with no clothes on with a boa constrictor and draw a crowd. When my grandparents would uh, rent a theater, my grandmother would work the ticket booth and then he would be upstairs running the projector. So she would control the money and he would control the print. If they did the film like uh, The Birth of a Baby, where they had the segregated audience of men and women, then they would go out and pitch the book, you know, the sex books or whatever. And they would have them in a plain brown envelope and say, you know, don't open it till you get home, you know, and you're safe. And Vic used to tell me that if they ran out of the books, they would put in copies of Time or old newspapers or whatever, you know, in these brown envelopes and sell them at 50 cents or a buck each, which was a lot of money back then. And the thing is, the people would get home, and they'd open it up and plot this old newspaper. And what are they going to do? Go to the police and say, I was ripped off by by buying something I wasn't supposed to have anyway, and that there was a you know, very gray area. Whatever the theme of the movie was, is how he would dress the theater. If it was an animal picture, he had animals. If it was like one of the Grella movies, have a guy in a Grella outfit. And Elmer, he was a convenient prop to be used to blame no matter what, how he got dead. It didn't matter. He was, you know, vicious drugs, you know, too much alcohol, you know, venereal disease. You know, whatever it was that they were selling, you know, poor Elmer had it happen to him. When Lewis Sonny died, his son Dan inherited the business and Elmer. In the 1950s, Sonny Amusement Enterprises operated out of Cordova Street in downtown Los Angeles, known as Film Row, because all the big Hollywood distributors had their headquarters there. Everybody would come down to see Dan, and Dan was a character on film roll. Guys would come in to play cards with Dan all afternoon. I mean, Zanuck would come down, the Scourus would come down, Jack Warner would come down, and the gin rummy games in Dan's office uh, were legendary. So they'd come in, and Dan had to show him that stiff. I mean, <laughs> all my friends knew about Elmer. He was my uncle, you know. He was in a part of the family. Elmer actually was housed in this building... All the time I can remember growing up, we had him in a closet where we kept files, legal-sized files, and Elmer set the, his casket set up above the files. I would never look at Elmer. Uh, my sisters, my two younger sisters would always like, like to look at Elmer, and they'd, they'd giggle and run away, and, but I would never look at Elmer. Never. I would never look at Elmer. I believed that he was really a dead man, and I didn't want to look at him just gave me the spooks. I grew up in Hollywood, and I grew up with all the movie stars' kids, and I went to school with them, and every all the families were kind of goofy, even if they were in the legitimate side of it. We were used to living in the most outrageous circumstances. We didn't know it at the time, but everything to us has to be high drama and spectacular and really a story, and we all she talks like this and I talk like this and everybody's so dramatic and everybody's loud and you know, dramatic. Right, Daddy? That's right. I don't think Dan ever used Elmer in any pictures but I had him stacked up in the back of a shot of She Freak. We took him out of the coffin and just had him standing up there. Elmer never made it to the final version of She Freak. His contribution was left on the cutting room floor. In the original version of the shot, we had a pan, and Elmer was standing up in the back uh, before we looked down in the pit. And then when you look down in the pit, there's the girl with the snakes and the skeleton and what have you. She was geeking it up, you know. She's got the uh, got the snakes around her. Ah, she's all her eye is all cocked out and the whole thing. The actress was a very nice girl. Yes, indeed. A very, very nice girl. Very successful. She owned a chain of ladies ready-to-wear uh, shops called Sassy Pants. But uh, that was the only time I ever used Elmer. 
oh, it was crazy. <laughs> it was like uh, there was always something happening. And um, Beatrice, Dad's secretary, they'd all be, Dad would usually be yelling at her for one reason or another, and she'd be scurrying around. <sighs> Me was an apparition. She was a great secretary. She could type, take dictation, 7,500 words a minute, type like Dan would say, you tell that dirty SOB if he doesn't pay, I'm going to come out there and kick the... And she'd write these, dear sir, your account is seriously past due. <laughs> <laughs> she was kind of very white and very pale looking, and she wore a lot of a lot of uh, heavy lipstick, and she was kind of thin and scary looking. She kind of reminded me of Elmer in a way. She kind of had that that look to her. Dan would get upset with her on some minor thing. God damn you, B. You doing this to give me a heart attack. Damn you, B. You wouldn't make a good whore. Ah, don't you talk to me like that, Mr. Sonny. I'm going to call the police. All right, B. I take it back. You would make a good whore. Oh, Mr. Sonny. How could you talk to me like that? And she'd go scurrying off. And uh, we'd all laugh all the time. Oh, she was a good girl. I had her since 19... Uh... Had her for about 35 years. She was an old maid. She was a very lovely Jewish woman. Never had a boyfriend. She was very orthodox. And the whole idea of a human body not being interred in the earth was an anemone to her. I mean, she couldn't stand it. And Dan would have loved, come on, B, you gotta look at, you gotta look at, uh, at Elba. Oh, Mr. Sonny, don't you know? No, no. Oh. One day, Dan takes his hacksaw and saws the arm off Elmer. And I got into the office, and El Dan is trying to goose me with this arm. And she is screaming bloody much. She had a voice so high-pitched she could break window glass with it. And why the police never came, I don't know. So after that little caper, Dan put the arm back on with uh, electrician's tape. <laughs> but that's why the arm fell off. <laughs> And now, Sunny Amusement property is a Presbyterian church. Uh, they bought the property from my father about 15 years ago. A Korean Presbyterian church, I believe. In the 1970s, Dan Sunny decided the time had come to clear out the remains of his father's old carnival show. He rang the owner of the Hollywood Wax Museum, a former Canadian lumberjack called Spoonie Singh named Dan Sonny phoned me up and told me that he had a bunch of old artifacts. At the same time, he said, we've got a, a, a mummy here, a, a, a little outlaw called Elmer Purdy. Well, I'd never heard of him, and when I looked at the thing, it was so awful, you know. I said, well, I, I certainly couldn't show that anywhere. Just like the ugliest looking little monkey you ever seen. My, mind you, you know, he wasn't a big man anyhow, and then mummified. I can't see anyone looking very good. No, I wasn't sad to see him go. He was in my way. See, I went, I, the wax show for 10 years took a lot of room up, and I had him taking room up, and I just glad to see that stuff out. It was crap, as far as I was concerned, because I was in the motion picture business. You understand? I wasn't glad. To, I was glad to see it go. It was history. Spoonie Singh offloaded the mummy onto friends who ran a sideshow in the Long Beach Fun Fair. When they moved on, they left Elmer behind. There was no one to remember he was human, and he ended up as an anonymous ghoul in the Laugh in the Dark ghost ride. It was just for people that wanted to go through there and kiss, you know. That was the Laugh in the Dark thing. I, nobody cared what was in there. I just went through the, the, the sailors and the, the kids. You know, you wanted to go through and kiss, so you get in the laugh in the dark. And I don't think too many people actually saw that guy. <laughs> a little blonde siren was at the day. She thought her boyfriend just didn't race. He took her to an amusement park, you noble kind. Now these happy thoughts run through her mind. You made an impression on me. 
at the amusement park when we rode through the Venetian Canal in the dark. Well, they had 300,000 sailors a half mile down the road. You know, get on the bus and boom, they were here. So they came down here and then consequently all of the young girls in the neighborhood came down because the sailors had money. You know, and then uh, all the girls were down here, so consequently all the boys from the neighborhood came down here. Come down, get tattooed, ride the rides. There were two or three dance halls and a bunch of bars. You know, it was something for them to do on the weekend. They had a guy that used to do a... a he, uh, he had a cable, and uh, he'd ride the cable, set himself on fire, you know, come down the cable. Well, one day he, he got sick and couldn't go on. So another guy said, well, hell, I can do that. So he... He, you know, puts, puts his uh, clothes on, he puts his gasoline and on, sets himself on fire and goes roaring down the cable. Well, he didn't realize the guy had an asbestos suit, almost burned himself to death. Anyway, after he got off, he said, I figured there might have been a trick to it, he said. <laughs> I had a little sideshow there. You see all the, the attractions you paid for. And then uh, the fellow would tell you, now there's one more thing. And it's this mermaid, and it, it, she can only breathe through her skin, not through her mouth. And so it's very sensitive, and uh, she doesn't have any clothes, so you, you, know, you have to realize that before and uh, take you in another. If you want to see this, you know, it's an extra dollar to see it. It's a very sensitive thing, and it's a mermaid. So anyway, it picks everybody's interest. You know, you got to see this mermaid only breathes through her skin, doesn't have any clothes on. So everybody, you know, the room fills up, and everybody gets another dollar out of you, and you go in there, and there's a little, there's a little glass about this big, because it's very sensitive, and you, have, and you look through there, and there's this woman standing there with a little mermaid out, a little, bur, you know, mermaid, she's going like this, you know, and it's, and you know, you've been duped. Now, on the pike, it's gone. We're the last amusement facility in Long Beach. The Loop's Light Align, the most, the world's most thrilling and fascinating individual skill game, as it says on the wall. Yeah, we've been here since 1941. I went broke, you know. They moved the Navy to San Diego. Oh, it was heartbreaking. Some some place you grew up, you know what I mean? Nowadays, heck, there's nothing down here but us. I carry a gun. Yeah, I'm protected pretty well. I have a 45 caliber gun. It was on Tuesday, December the 7th, 1976, that the body of Elmer McCurdy was found hanging by the neck inside the laugh in the dark. He was just hanging there, swinging, turning, you know, just from the just from us walking by, the breeze would, would make him turn. He would, he'd been painted, uh, I guess, six times with iridescent paint, and uh, I felt sorry for the for the corpse for the simple reason it looked like he had a tear. And really, if you saw the pictures, there was a tear that that was running down his face, you know. And upon closer look, uh, you could see hair growing off the skin. You know, it was hair follicles still growing. All through the years that I was on the fire department, I never did feel that way about uh, seeing a body. Maybe it was the fact it had been just stacked like a, a piece of uh, paper or a piece of cardboard or something like that and just taken out whenever somebody had a whim to have a new attraction down there. And uh, it was just, uh, it hit me funny, I'll tell you that. It just really did. I told my wife about it, and so, you know, softy, you know. <laughs> the fire department called in the police. The police called in the Los Angeles County Coroner. Dr. Noguchi was used to coping with unusual corpses. Uh, Marion Monroe, 1962. Uh, William Holden, not a word, and 83, there are quite a few. So I was one time called coroner to the stars. The Kadaiba, which I view, are not the same as the Kadaiba most people would uh, imagine. Instead of a gray, green color, I see the Kadaiba with uh, multiple color with intensity. 
often the evidence is like staring at me with the color of a red orange, uh, intense yellow orange type of a color that I, uh, I, I see. In the case of the Long Beach mummy, they quickly established the cause of death, a gunshot wound, but they had no idea whose corpse it was. The first real clue came from the body itself. In the, in the mouth, its uh, mouth was slightly open. We uh, found a torn entrance ticket with a coin. I, I suppose that's not the custom, a customary place, but it's uh, those a brave uh, soul, uh, probably challenged the mummy, put the penny as part of the lock, I suppose, and the ticket in. And those are a clue for us to find who he was. The ticket stub led them back to Dan Sonny and to the name of Elmer McCurdy. But only his family had the right to claim his body, and the amusement park didn't count as next of kin. Who can have the custody of uh, Elwa Marcosi is became an issue. Uh, uh, I, as a coroner, uh, we need to make sure that the right person who receives the custody. There is a call from uh, Mr. Fred Owls, curator of the Oklahoma State Territorial Museum. And uh, we invited him. He came in with this, uh, uh, his favorite hat, uh, typical Oklahoma in the century ago. We went out to beg for the body and to bring it back. Noguchi was very analytical. He said, uh, he said, uh, you want to know what he ate? And I said, what do you eat? He says, cornbread, bacon, uh, he named off some things. He said a, a, a lot of whiskey in the intestinal tract, in the stomach. So he knew that he'd really sopped up the whiskey, I guess. The body, you could just pick it up like that. It was as light as if it were balsa. It was completely dehydrated. We put on rubber gloves. And uh, uh, I remember as a kid, it's an old way, but uh, the body is, is loaded with arsenic. And uh, just to touch it with your hands, uh, according to Noguchi, you could it would, you could get it. It's gone into all the tissue. Therefore, well, I never understood that. But uh, don't you remember that, Bill? Not kissing. You never. You didn't really touch them with your lips if they if they'd been embalmed. On April the 16th, 1977, Elmer McCurdy set out on his last journey back to Oklahoma. He traveled by plane to Guthrie to join the other outlaws at the bottom end of the old cemetery. We call it Boot Hill. They put the outlaws down here, and these folks down here aren't as close to heaven as folks up there on the hill. They're buried on the hill up there, the good folks. There are a few girls from the body house buried around in here. Their names are still around. Sweethearts or something. I don't know anything about the women. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, there's Tom Capers. He got killed in the crap game. You know, the newspaper had some headlines, Capers craps out. <laughs> That's the truth. Yes. <laughs> and who else? There's oh, Little Dick West. Little Dick West, Charlie Pierce. The old grave of Bill Doolin over there was marked with a buggy axle for many years. A buggy axle? Wasn't it? it was marked with a buggy axle yeah. for uh, many years. You knew who mm -hmm. has it? Bailey you Haynes. Know, Bailey Haynes. That was Bill du Doolin. Doolin. He was killed with a... Have you ever heard of an eight-gauge shotgun? <laughs> They're about the size of a cannon. And it was for killing a lot of geese and ducks at one time. It had a long barrel. Uh, Heck, Thomas hauled him back to town in a wagon. They took him to the undertaker, and people could hardly wait to see him. And so they they put him up. The famous picture is he's lying there like that on this board. Some people even got a chance to touch his body and got some blood. I mean, that double barrel just blew him full of holes. The Gucci said, please give McCurdy a good Christian burial. He said, promise me that you won't make a circus of it. He said, we won't do that. We'll do whatever he read. And we did it. And Bill knows that we, there was no laughing and smiling and clowning around. We treated this outlaw just like he was a friend of ours. That we were being 
the pallbearers. Elmer McCurdy, we rejected you before and refused to claim your body. Now we affirm that you are one of us. And after so many years, it is time to lay you to eternal rest in death with those companions that you sought in life. Amen and amen. My worry was he have surfaced many, many times. I wanted to make sure that uh, he will not surface ever again. One of the conditions that uh, I have raised as a coroner request was that for a cement and the thickness of uh, six feet, two meters, I'm sure that the atomic bomb would not crack that open. Oh, uh, yeah. That, uh, there's a road right up there, and that's, remember the, the cement mixer, the big uh, thing? Yeah. He was waiting on us up there, and then after everybody left, and they were going to, I motioned to him, come on down, and I don't know where I got that piece of cardboard. It was a big piece of cardboard from something. That nice coffin that he had, that we, that we put him in, because he had him in the cardboard box when they shipped him. And uh, I laid that cardboard on there, and then he just, he just laid it right in there and filled it up. One of the things I remember when we buried Elmer McCurdy is as we were lowering the casket into the grave, there was a, a girl, I'd call her a flower child, that had the typical little small glasses, you know, and long, uh, straight blonde hair. And she had a tear in her eye. And as that casket was being lowered, she took a single rose and dropped it on the casket. I have no idea who she was. I'll never forget you.